Well, good morning. This, this is Dr. Michael Erickson, pastor of Big Bear Four Square Church. Had some good responses from Africa and Kenya and Tanzania this last week. And uh, going to be preaching the word of the Lord and God's good. Here in the United States, we're celebrating Memorial Weekend for all the soldiers that have fallen in all the wars in America from the Revolutionary War clear to the present time. It's not for the surviving uh, veterans, that's Veterans Day, and those who are in uniform, that's Armed Forces Day, but today's Memorial Weekend and we remember those sacrifices and enjoy the benefits of it. Let you know the type of preaching, this is for my guests this morning. For the last seven or eight years, I've been doing expository preaching, which means we take a book of the New Testament or Old Testament and go verse by verse throughout the book until we're done. The nice thing about that is that I come to a passage and it tells me what to preach. And I can't say, oh, no, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes I thought, oh, the well, people are not going to like this. Yeah. And then uh, at times I thought, oh, Paul, why did you say it so harshly to James? And why people like you to, to be nicer. Mm -hmm. But that's the word that comes as it, as it is. Well, let's go to Galatians chapter 2 verse 11 through 21. This is already our fifth sermon in the book of Galatians. And the title of the message is called The Confrontation. Let's pray. Father God, I need your help today to discern your purposes and direction in the word of God for your people. I pray for an anointing upon myself because your word is always anointed. Lord, I pray for the people that they would have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive what you have for them today. Help them to be blessed, ministered to, and spoken to by the life of the Holy Spirit. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Confrontation. Well, let's start off with verse 11. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to, I had to oppose him to the face. For what he did was very wrong. Confrontation is never easy, is it? No. Some people avoid confrontations to so much that they live with all the bad choices of other people and, or, and they go that far to, to an extreme so that when they're fed up and had too much, the next thing they do is leave. The confrontation is made for, is part of our, our makeup and it's a necessity to keep good relationships going. <coughs> A marriage without confrontation is, in time, going to develop two separate people who are going to say, well, whatever, I know, that, I know what that's like. And having needs that are not met or having issues unresolved, and then anger comes in and stuff. So what happens for a lot of people without confrontation in marriage is they go to a spiritual divorce. And that might last for a while until there's a real divorce. We don't want those things. We want to retain, retain marriage, we want to retain friendships, we want to retain relationships. So confrontation is important. I would tell you this, that confrontation also is for the brave. And if you're not, if you're kind of about a little chicken about confrontation, 
then what happens is that when you get too angry, then you get brave, and then you're going to give it to them. <laughs> By then, it's possibly too late to make a difference. Mm -hmm. But in verse 11, Paul says, I felt the need, I, I, I had to oppose Peter to his face. The English word confrontation to confront, con, with, front, the front. With, actually what it really means is go face to face. And when we go face to face, that could be initially good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. But if... But then it's a heart check. Why am I confronting in this issue in this place? Why is that so important? Well, if my motives is to, I'm going to bury this person, that's what I would confront him for, then that motive is not going to really reap the godly benefits that God wants. So confrontation is sometimes necessary to res reserve Resolve a difference or an issue. <clears throat> the English word confrontation literally means face to face. Mm -hmm. But let it be the goal, and usually the goal of confrontation is to resolve the difference or issue or problem that's in front of you. We often think of battlefield confrontation and when I think of this type of word I think of the Civil War battles when they came face to face musket to musket uh, bayonets hand to hand the confrontation was face to face so Peter's been through it so far in our the history of how things go First of all, God confronts Peter on the issue of the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. Peter's hungry for lunch, and I'm sure those who are providing lunch for him says, it's going to be really good, but it's going to take a while. Why don't you go upstairs and take a nap? Okay, I think I'll do that. He goes upstairs and takes a nap, and God comes down with a sheet, pulled animals, unclean and and God says rise kill and eat and Peter talks back to God what's, what's with you I've never eaten anything unclean in my life what are, you, what are we doing she goes up comes back down Peter rise kill and eat Lord I can you imagine arguing with God? Well, not unlike you, right? So, God, I've never eaten anything unclean. After three times, God says, listen, here's the problem. Don't you un call unclean what I've made clean. Don't you? And then God, God had a meeting with Cornelius Reddy, Right? Cornelius had a heart for God, gave to the poor, man of prayer, loved the Lord, but he was a Gentile. So God tells Peter to go with Cornelius and very specific instructions. And Cornelius tells them the vision and and then says they say, well, preach. He says, why did you send me? So Peter begins to preach. During his preaching, they all started speaking in tongues. We, that's pretty nice, right? Started speaking in tongues. And he said, oh, wow, the Gentiles are not supposed to do that. They're not even supposed to get saved. Now they're speaking in tongues. That was a sign that they got saved during the message. And God filled the Holy Spirit. And Peter is convinced at the end of these meetings, 
God has embraced the Gentiles. You think Peter would have done that on his own? No, I'm sorry, he wouldn't have. He would have said, no, those going, those Gentile dogs, the sinners, and we'll just let them alone. We're going to do what we continue to do. But God confronted him in that. Then in chapter 11, the Messianic Jews didn't like what Peter was doing, eating with Cornelius and having that interaction. So they confront him. So second confrontation, Peter explains what God had said, what God had done, and he said, we're good. And then a little while later, Paul comes and confronts Peter in Antioch, where they were first called Christians, on the same issue, third time, same issue, Genesis, Galatians 2. This has become such a big issue that it's finally resolved in Acts chapter 15 at the Council of Jerusalem. It took 14 years to resolve this issue. Sometimes, you, you know, the problem was is you got two stubborn heads coming together and God has to do work with each individual and things happen and get things resolved. The harder the things are and the more that people resist, the longer it takes. So just like that song, I surrender, just surrender Amen. when you're confronted by the Lord. Yeah. Verse 12, when he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterwards, when some friends of James, now James, the Lord's brother, is the number one guy among the apostles. He is the bishop of Jerusalem, the pastor to the 12 apostles. He's the number one guy in the church. In church authority, it wasn't Matthew, it wasn't Sim, uh, Simon the Zealot, it wasn't Philip, it wasn't Andrew. James was the main guy. And so everybody knew that. So there was kind of a, even Peter said, oh, I don't want to fame James. So when he comes, we're going to, we're going to ignore this. We're not going to confront this. We're going to ignore this. And I'm going to play along. We can't relate, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not okay with me, but I'm good. I'm good, you're good, we're all good, everybody's good. And if we're not good, we're a bad guy. That's the attitude of the world right now, isn't it? But afterwards, when some friends of James came, and he's the ultimate Messianic Jew, I mean, he, the legend is that he prayed at the temple till his knees looked like camel's knees. And he was highly respected among the Jewish community as a messianic, not as a messianic leader, but as a righteous man of God. So Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism. He, look at that word. He was afraid of confrontation. He was afraid of criticism. Mm -hmm. What do you take from Peter? I take encouragement from that. Well, if the big guy's a little afraid, you know. <laughs> I mean, it comes natural. We have to persevere, push through, and be brave and do what's, what's right. A lot of times the person that needs to do confronting, like in Paul's place, Paul has a disposition for it. He says, I didn't respect any uh, who they were because God shows no favoritisms. 
So he just went, Peter, you're absolutely wrong with this. Now, who are you? I'm Paul. Never mind that, but you're wrong eating with the Gentiles, now eating with the Jews, and pretending that you're both camps. Mm -hmm. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. James still did not have the revelation that the Gentiles could receive Jesus Christ and not be circumcised. They weren't quite there yet. That's coming up in Acts chapter 15. But verse 4, 13 says, as a result, other Jewish, Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. Uh, I don't like to think of Peter as a hypocrite because I think of his heart as good with, with the Lord, but God had to work with him to, to iron out some things. The world says we're full, the church is full of hypocrites. Maybe so, but we're working on it. We're confronting those issues. We're, we're work in progress. We're work working on our salvation with fear and trembling. We might have some of that, but we're not always going to have that. And if you want the perfect church, don't go to it because you're going to ruin it once you get there. <laughs> and even Barnabas, who was the one that connected the apostles to Paul in the first place, was led astray by their hypocrisy. So, so, you know, Paul is a pretty passionate guy. He is. He's hot when he needs to be and setting things straight. He's on fire with his passion for preaching and teaching. But he's a passionate guy, in, you know, in general. On Facebook, it says, uh, it said, what would you be if you were a road sign? My mind said, Michael, a little bit of sunshine mixed with a hurricane. <laughs> I said, I said well, kind of like Fitz. But Paul is blazing the trail. This is his first book. He hasn't written any other books yet. He's blazing the, blazing the trail for uh, sound theological teaching on what salvation is. And Paul's eventually going to get us the New Testament and come down to the fact Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, and confessing him as Lord is the gospel for salvation. You can't add anything to it. Nothing. No baptism. No circumcision, no hit in the head, nothing. You can't add anything to the gospel message. Mm -hmm. What can you add to the gospel message? Nothing. nothing. It's acquired by faith and repentance in Jesus Christ. And if somebody does that and they're saved, and they say, what do I do next? Well, to be really saved, uh, you have to be baptized have to be circumcised and give 20%. Now, whatever else is added to it, Paul says that is not the gospel and he's trying to blaze a trail here theologically for the Christians to understand that salvation is simple. Right? right. What do I need to do to, to add to salvation, nothing by grace you are saved through faith. But Paul is, this is the second chapter of the, United, of the entire New Testament being written. James wrote his book in 46 AD. Paul's writing Galatians in 48. It's a brand new ballgame, okay? 
verse 16. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. Is your tra translation have anything else? Did we skip some verses? Did we? Yeah, 14. Yeah. Yeah, 14. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> My notes skipped me. Sorry about that. Go back to the Bible. Okay. <laughs> Verse 14. Rewind. Rewind. Paul says, Now, when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message that we just talked about, I said to Peter, in front of all the others, confront, confront, in front, face to face. Since you are a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make those Gentiles, these Gentiles, foolish Jewish traditions? Mm -hmm. Church, I'm telling you, don't... You don't have to follow Jewish traditions. Amen. You don't have to be a Judaizer. You don't have to be Torah observant. You don't have to be a Messianic Gentile. You're Gentiles. So don't try to be Jews because Paul is fighting for this. And it's calling, don't exchange your freedom for a bunch of bondage. One thing about the Torah observant, they want to observe God's law, right? With God's law comes the punishments for breaking those laws. So I say, I'm Torah observant. Okay, you should not steal. Got it. Oh, I stole. Okay, now the penalty for that is to lay down and to get beaten with the rods. 39 lashes in front of the congregation. How many of you still want to be Torah observant? <clears throat> you know what? And I think people that want to be <coughs> Messianic Gentiles, Torah observant, and Judaizers and this, like to have fun with it. It's not a game. I mean, it's truly takes you to crossing the line. Then once you're Torah observant, if you have a baby boy born in their house, say, oh no, now God wants us to circumcise that baby boy. No, he doesn't read the book of Galatians, because once you do, you're into doctrinal apostasy and moral apostasy, and you are no longer a Christian, period. I don't want to mess around with that line, do you? No. Verse 15, he says, You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. And the word sinner there is the actual title for the Gentiles that the Jews came up with. It means that anyone who does not attend the temple, attend the synagogue, or been circumcised, or part of the nation of Israel. That word sinner means those that are the outside. So if everybody's a sinner but we're not, then the Jews thought of themselves as righteous. But Paul fixes that in Romans 1 concerning the Gentiles and Romans 2 concerning the Jews. And so Paul is blazing the trail here, trying to explain his, these things. Now verse 16, thank you so much, Victor. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law, period. See that? Now, the Jews were really smart about the law. 
First of all, the, sentence, the law says, you shall not, you shall keep the Sabbath holy. Don't break the Sabbath. They said, okay, that's fine. No work on the Sabbath. So the Jews said, yes, okay, but what is work? So they devised 39 more laws to define what work is. And, and Jesus fought against that his own ministry. Because mm -hmm. it was after the tabernacle. The word rafa means to sew back together. And the laws, their law said you can't sew somebody, rafa, heal them, put them back together mm -hmm. on the Sabbath. And Jesus was fed up with the Jewish laws and tradition that actually hindered God from moving in people's lives. I told this story last week. I went to Fairfax District in Los Angeles, Little Israel, and I ate at one of the Jewish restaurants there, and I loved the place. And uh, so I ordered a cob salad. How many? I love cob salads. Mm -hmm. And in the cob salad was a wedge of bacon. I said to my, I said to my waiter, Are, is this a Jewish restaurant? He said, yes. I said, is that a wedge of bacon in my cob salad? He says, yes. Be free. <laughs> and he was quoting what Paul has been saying without even meaning it, but it spoke to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. Some of these people have told me, we want to obey the law to please Jesus. Is it okay? If you don't obey the law, is it sin? No, it just means that we want to do this to please Jesus. The Bible says, if you disobey the law, it's sin, period. So now you have to have a remedy for that to be right with God. And Paul's saying, why do you Gentiles want to put yourself through that? You don't need the 613th commandment laws of the Torah. You don't have to do all these things. Be free in Jesus. How can we be free? When we're born again, we've got a new nature and the old one has been crucified. And what people with, the, with trying to do the law is not crucifying the old nature, not walking in the new nature, but trying to please God on their own. How's that work? It doesn't. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. Now this is written in 48 AD and the Book of Romans is written about eight or nine years later. But the book of Galatians is the foundation book for the book of Romans. So the book of Romans expounds on what the book of Galatians teaches. And that's the, because uh, Romans is founded upon the book of Galatians. What is given in this passage that we're reading and talking about this morning in the, in the book of Galatians, is fully explained in Romans chapter 3 through 8. Okay. What I've read to you in Galatians is fully explained in Romans 3 through 8. Verse 17, you okay? But suppose 
we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty because we have abandoned the law. Good question, right? Would that mean that Christ led us into sin? We don't have to do the law because we're serving Christ. Does that mean that Christ leads us into sin? Absolutely not. Doesn't it sound like Romans? Mm -hmm. Highlight verse 18. Rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of law. I have already torn down. So the great sinners in the body of Christ are the Judaizers, the Torah observant, those that are trying to be Messianic, Gentiles. Why? Because verse 18 says, I'm a sinner. Why would I want to rebuild the old system of law that I've already tore down? Where'd that law go? Jesus says, I fulfilled it all. I've done it all, fulfilled it all. Also what Paul tells Also what tell, Paul tells us in Galatians and Romans is that if you want to do these things by the law James says this in James chapter 1 and 2. You're going to have to walk by the law and do the law. Verse 19, for when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. Paul's trying to change a focus here of how to overcome sin. The law says, do not covet. And we're walking around all the time because we see nice trucks on the road. <coughs> we see that. Uh, what's the deal about coveting? It keeps a focus on us, what we want, what we want. So if we say, okay, I'm not going to covet anymore, who's in charge of that? I am. I'm not going to do this. I'm this. So what's the answer if you find yourself a little selfish and self-centered on company? Set that aside and love your neighbor as yourself. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Love your neighbor more than yourself. Be truly humble and be a servant to your neighbor. What happens if you do that? You don't have to worry about coveting, it's gone. It's not even a thought. But if you want to do it on your own and try to concentrate on the law, you're going to mess it up really bad. And part of the problem is that we used to be real good at messing up the law anyway in the first place. And so the reason that we got saved is to get set free from all that junk. Sorry, that's a junk in the pulpit. I usually don't do that, so. Verse 19, for when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me, so I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all the requirements of the law so that I might live for God. Be free. Now, here's, here's the thing, very simple. You're free to do anything you want but sin. Have a good lunch. What do I mean? Just have a great day. Enjoy your Memorial Weekend. Don't sin and just enjoy your time. I stopped trying to meet the requirements of the law so that I might live to God. Verse 20 My old self has been crucified with Christ. Romans 6, 7, and 8. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, Philippians chapter 3. 
So now in my earthly body, by trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. You know, I'll tell you something that's kind of enlightening. God actually likes you. Yeah. He, he actually likes you. I mean, that's kind of surprising to me. God created your personality and who you are. He actually likes you. He's called you his child. He's pleased with you. Let's be happy with that. Thank you, Lord. I love you, too. So I live in this early earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Verse 21, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, Romans chapter 6, okay. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there would no, be no need for Christ to die, Hebrews 8 through 10. If we could do it, he didn't need to come. If you could do it, why would you put Jesus through all the stuff that he went through? Why would he do that? I, I think the logical thing was would be, I'm going to pass on that because you guys got it. You can, you can do this. But he knew that none of us could do this. None of us could even come close. So he says, I have to take this on myself because... Their best efforts are like filthy rights, Isaiah says. So, and besides his love for us, Hebrews 12, 1 through 4 says, For the joy set before him that you and me, he endured the cross. Why do we need to add anything to that? Paul says, if you do, you're cut off from Christ. Father God, I want to thank you for my precious people here today in this church who have heard the word. I pray that the word would set their hearts on fire and they would t totally be free in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and grace. I love you and I praise you and thank you for revealing to your people that we need to persist in the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.